There are so many factors that are playing out right now that I do think it is a civilizational moment. It's an age in which humans have to discover that their ability to survive and thrive depends both on each other and in their relationship with the planet. I chose business as a way to create change because I always knew I wanted to make an impact. And for me, the challenges that I wanted to tackle happen to be challenges that are aligned with sustainable development goals. I think the evolution of the development world already is developing different visions, and rightly so. I don't think that development will come with only a single focus or a single vision because they have to cater to so many different situations. If you think about the future of development, the first thing that comes to mind is disruption. We have lived through a pandemic. The UNDP Human Development Report estimates that we regress probably to the year 2016 in terms of development progress. We obviously have to deal with a great deal of these disruptions right now, but what is quite clear is that there are also opportunities. I think the increasing recognition in the power of technology are driving change in the development world. I also think it's becoming more inclusive in involving the young people, a collaboration between the private and public sector but also an understanding in the importance of having local partners and local knowledge when building solutions. I think the factors that are now driving the change in the development world is a more attuned approach towards people-centered development. So I think these are some of the things that we have to now build upon and build upon in a way where we are able to transfer a belief in the equal right to dignity to the next generation. When it comes to our planet, climate change, loss of biodiversity, we are living through seismic shifts in the way that this planet will either be able to continue to function or not. The first challenge we have is, how do we cope with the short term, not at the expense of the long term? The way I define intergenerational equity is very simple. It's making sure that the generation alive today does not compromise the needs and the interests of those to come. It means that in every action that we take and the decisions that we make, we are keeping in mind the impacts of those decisions and actions. I think that is going to be part of the debate of our generation and the next generation. How do we set the parameters for making decisions about what matters and which things we want to invest? And that takes me to a more fundamental issue, which has to do with the way that we also measure progress. Because this notion of the gross domestic product being really the only singular figure with which we judge an economy's health or lack of health, its success, is just very misleading. The kind of progress that I see for the future in the human rights field is, I think of it as one step forward, two steps backward. So even that one step forward brings us more and more opportunities to open more ways for people to see development as a link towards the realization of human rights. My vision for the future of development is one where all people have access to the resources and opportunities that they need to grow and succeed, regardless of their background and circumstances. It's not always about giving aid, it's more about working you know, with local communities and empowering them and supporting them to not only help themselves, but also help the world as a whole. The most important change that I see in terms of my own human rights work with vulnerable communities is where it has been possible for us not to be the agents for those communities. You transfer leadership to the communities themselves and increase their ability to organize themselves. You can't be somebody else's agent of change forever. Digitalization is changing virtually every aspect of development. And something we might not have thought imaginable just a few years ago is today a reality. These are extraordinary breakthroughs. I'm the co-founder and CTO of FIXA, and FIXA is a digital staffing agency that connects Africa's frontline workers with job opportunities. Over 400 million workers on the African continent are employed informally 
That means they have no formal employment contracts, they have no access to social protection, no access to health insurance, bank accounts. So what we do at Fixer is by digitizing these workers, we provide them a digital career identity that allows them not only to access more job opportunities, but also to access finance. Another example is women in the financial system. Millions of women would never have been able to open an account in the traditional banking system. Today, we see women being able to leverage digital finance systems. They can even borrow money in the morning, buy goods in the wholesale market, sell their goods during the day and repay the loan on their smartphone. This is the kind of technology revolution that can also enable development to suddenly pivot forward in ways that we might not have imagined. When you're using technology, there is always a digital divide, and mainly that is due to access. Our technological solutions should not only be scalable, but they should also take into account people who cannot access specific technologies as well. Especially in countries like mine, where, you know, 80% of the people don't have access to mobile phones or the internet. They need to know that there is somebody who's talking about what they feel is their everyday problem. Development is always a commitment to looking for those who are least likely to be able to help themselves. That is how social safety nets are built. That's how social cohesion is built. That's how solidarity in a society grows also. Development doesn't have this possibility of being a top-down approach. It has to be a bottom-up approach. So minorities, whether they are religious or ethnic minorities or racial minorities, these are the people that you must see. And everybody has rights. Look at the indigenous people, for instance. The fact that they lost these rights on the way, and that was called development, now seems such a ridiculous idea to us. If development models are serving communities, it is only then that development becomes sustainable. I'm now almost 70 years old. And I know that the many of the challenges that I face as a human rights defender or as a woman will not go away in my lifetime. But I have to open the way for others. I think it's very important to involve youth in development planning and decision making because a lot of these decisions affect youth at the end of the day the most. I think having youth at the forefront will give them a sense of ownership and a sense of leadership to come up with solutions and be responsible for the world that they want to build. The future of development cooperation is a far more attractive one because it's not one group, one region, one country or one individual coming and bringing something. It's about co-creation with mutual benefits. And that is very much what we are investing in in UNDP today when we look at some of the key areas that will shape the development agenda of the future. I see signs of hope every day. As part of the group of elders, we have celebrated these sparks of hope. And these are young people who are taking that initiative, are working for peace, for human rights, for democracy. So I do see sparks of hope everywhere. But as I said, these are sparks. We want fires of hope.